it was very much, I think my sense of humor was developed from a place, or at least the way I uh, express it was, was always like, I'm going to beat you to the joke, right? Like, I know what's wrong with me, or I know what you think is wrong with me. I know that my shoes are from Payless or that my clothes are from the Goodwill. I know that I'm fat. I know my teeth are fucked up. Can I curse on here? Oh yeah, that? of course, okay. please. Um, And so it was like, as a kid, rather than like try to recover, <laughs> you know, once like an insult was deployed, it's like, well, if I beat them to the punch, then it kind of like takes their knees out from under them. And I, so I think that is what, started that's what kind of like made me decide to be I, I don't know if you can decide to be a funny person but I think that's when I decided to like take things less seriously and always just like try to be a jester um because it sort of like kept the other pressure off me right like if I'm funny I don't have to talk to anyone about being poor or if I'm funny I don't have to tell anyone like why I don't live with my parents or, you know, it just was like, it's an easy way to deflect that. Maybe I take advantage of too often. <laughs> like I, I love to make a joke and not like answer a question or solve a problem. And I think that can be frustrating for other people, but in terms of like both getting through life and the work, it has, it's my like greatest asset, I think, is just knowing how to take a fucking joke and how, and how to make one, but how to take one, I think is the, is the bigger hurdle. And I got good at that early. <laughs> well, I think it's a high, I mean, I understand how it could become problematic, like psychologically and emotionally, if you overdo it, or if you use it in lieu of actually dealing with stuff but yeah it is uh especially considering the pretty chaotic situation and difficult situation in which you grew up yeah it's i find it like heartbreaking heartwarming and it's it's a high alchemy it's taking really difficult stuff and turning it into something quite lovely like being able to make yourself laugh and make other people laugh it's also shrewd for a young person to understand and to have that kind of self-awareness and to learn how to, like you said, take the knees out from people who might otherwise cause you trouble and to do it with comedy. Like you got to have your wits about you to do that. Yeah. I, I mean, it is, I think I always am just, even now, right. I am, um, I'm, I'm so like self-conscious and I'm so like, I want to be liked and I want people like if you hear my name to be like, oh, I like that person. Um, and I think to, like, again, it wasn't like I'm going to make myself this way. It just was like, this is what works to keep me to keep that feeling of like you are liked and people want to be around you. Like it was just like okay, I'm never, because like when you're a kid or a truly any time in life, um, you know, things like not having money and not having access, you can't just like wish those away, right? Like, I think I was very lucky that we lived in a really good suburb and I got to go to a really good high school. I mean, I didn't go much further than high school, so it truly like shaped who I am, but like, you can't, you can't fix, there was no way as a kid to like fix my family's poverty. So you feel like you could either feel like hopeless, which I did a lot. You'd be like, oh, my station in life is not changing every day. People are going to relentlessly remind me of what I don't have. Or you just like try to you know, like I can be honest with myself, like, yeah, this doesn't fit. And this did only cost 50 cents at the Salvation Army. But what I can do is rather than like, sort of dwell on what I can't fix, just kind of like, build a bit <laughs> around the thing to like, at least make, make me 
make me appear to like be okay with it in front of other people. And then like the longer you do that, the easier it becomes. Um, and the, the fooling other people into thinking you're okay is more seamless. And then it's like, you know, you hit a point where you're like, okay, I'm 30. I can't, I can't not be like this now. Right. Because I've spent my whole life being like this. And I guess, I mean, a mental health professional would probably say that it is unhealthy to um, kind of like decide how you're going to view life or how you're going to feel about things rather than just feeling them. But I think it was truly like the only way for me to get through and like hope that there was something better like on the other side of it. Because when you're a kid, I mean, truly, you're just like limited by what you have and what you see. And when that's not much, and when the people you're looking at don't have much, <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, I, there's no way for me to think of my future without like getting sad. So I'm just going to like look at my circumstances and try to laugh at them so that at least I don't feel bad or I don't feel as bad as my life is which sounds bleak. I'm trying to say this in the most hopeful I survived kind of way. <laughs> but you no, know, it was definitely like becoming like honing this sense of humor was like it saved me and I truly did not ever think it would be anything other than just like my armor for life. Like there was no part of me that was like oh, this, this one day will be very beneficial to me. I could like make a career out of this. Never. It truly was just about like, everyone I have a crush on does not have a crush on me back. I could cry about that or I could like make a joke. And it was always like, let's just make the joke. So yeah. for people listening, you were raised in Evanston, Illinois. Is that right? Yes. Yep, I was born and raised in Evanston, born at Evanston Hospital. It's where Northwestern is. It's a suburb just north of Chicago on Lake Michigan. And like, you know, people are always like, oh, you're not from Chicago. But there is a street in Evanston where one side of the street is Evanston and the other side is Chicago. <laughs> so it's not like I'm from some way out suburb. Like, come on. Um, yeah, I, my mom was a nurse, um, at Evanston Hospital, as was her mom, but they were originally from DC. And I honestly, I don't know why my mom picked and stayed in Evanston, but I'm really grateful that she did because, like I said, we didn't have anything but I learned to swim. <laughs> you know, I had after school programs where I learned things and I read and I was exposed to a lot, like thanks to the school system and like the generosity of my peers' parents. Sure, sure. And then your dad was kind of out of the picture. You write about this in the book. I think some of the most moving parts of Quietly Hostile get into this like family history yeah my dad was from well he was born in tunica mississippi okay dig this this will tell you everything you need to know about his circumstances growing up at third uh, 16 he lied to go fight in korea <laughs> because he thought that would be better than his life at home he was like, he lied to an army recruiter and was like, yeah, I'm 18. And you know, this is, I don't know what kind of IDs they had back then. My dad was born in 1936, right? Like, I'm, I'm sure he just like wrote I'm 18 on a piece of paper and they're like, great, go die in Korea. Um, <laughs> But he like, he had a, you know, just a super impoverished upbringing. He went to Korea. I mean, I think... PTSD from the war and rampant alcoholism just like destroyed his brain. Like he was, you know, there were times when he was great 
but then most of the time he was just like a brute he's terrible um and they like they my parents had lives like full my mom had had three daughters my dad had his own two kids in memphis um by the time they met and kind of like pushed their whole (laughs) their two um insane situations together and then like 10 years after that they they had me so so it's, you have uh, you have you have siblings who are significantly older than you. Yes, yeah, I'm 43 and my sisters are 63, 60 and 58. Like we are it I can't even say like we're different generations. I mean truly it is like having three grandmothers. You know? <laughs> Not because of age but because like Just being raised in the 60s and 70s versus being raised in the 80s and 90s. It's like we are, we are totally, totally different. Um, But yeah, I, my dad was, my dad met my mom when the youngest of my sisters was four. So he, he and and then he spent like 11 years 10 or 11 years with them before I was born and so he was like their he was like their stepdad um they never let him all the way in like they never called him dad um what did they call him (laughs) I mean this this is truly funny don't don't feel bad anyone but my sisters when they were little were all very skinny and my dad like jokingly would be like hey skinny and he wasn't a big dude but they like teasingly called him fat they'd be like hey fat and it just stuck so like my entire life they would like come in and be like is fat home it's like yes <laughs> why do you call him that but yeah that was that was their their nicknames for each other and, and he was around as a step parent now now i just am like it's the same deal like these kids don't call me mom they they usually call me like babe <laughs> because that's what i started calling them and it's like and i understand like when i was a kid i was like you guys should call him dad he he drives you to school you know or whatever and like now i i get it like it's not really your dad, but he's around all the time. You don't want to call him by his first name, so you give him a nickname. Like I, I get it now. Then I thought they were being mean to my daddy, but <laughs> now I get it. I get it. And so he was around. He was around until he hung in there till I was four, and then. That's when the, I mean, he was in and out of Hazelden for years, like trying to dry out and it never, it never really took, I mean, I have such a like, uh, uh, I I don't want to sound like condescending and be like, oh my God, I have such a um, compassion for addicts, but truly it's hard it is hard these are chemicals your brain is full of chemicals none of us understand our own chemicals um so when i was four he just he could not put off put down the bottle and he was abusive and my mom was like listen you're not gonna like whatever you've done okay but you're not gonna like hit me or the baby and then we we left Okay. And then he faltered, he was homeless, and then he went to Memphis for a while, and then he came back to Evanston. But he, yeah, he never could get out of the grip of alcohol. It was really, I mean, it's really sad. Totally. It's all, it's, addiction is, is a terrible illness. Yeah. And you lost, not to be like too morose, but I, the reason I ask and I want us to cover this is because it's so key i think to your formation as a funny person like oh sure yeah no nothing is off limits let's get into okay it. but you lost both of your parents by the time you were 18 i think they passed away within months of one another right yes 
my so I did go to college for one year, one or two semesters. It wasn't a full year. Um, to that end, I will say people who manage to get through college on their own with no help are truly the real heroes. I couldn't do it. It's like impossible to go to like a college with a dorm and have no place to go during spring break. You know what I mean? It was like, I, after that, I was like, oh, I got to get a job and just have a life because I can't, I cannot do this on my own. Um, oh my God. What was I even talking about? Oh, them dying. My one, <laughs> <laughs> my, the second semester of my one year, um, my dad came, he came from, he went from Memphis to Evanston because he was having heart problems and my entire childhood my dad had had this incredible doctor this like devout kosher no electricity on Sundays Jewish doctor Dr. Ira Weiss he like my dad saw that dude so much I think he had like four heart attacks over the course of his life that he was truly like part of our family you know like he would be at our house I did not realize that it's not normal to have a cardiologist just like (laughs) drop by until later um but so my dad was having some heart problems in Memphis went to Evanston where Dr. Weiss was waiting uh with open arms and he was put into I think he had had a heart attack And he was put into a nursing home that was right up the street from the nursing home my mom was in. And one day in February, he tells them that he's going to take a walk. And he walked to my mom's nursing home, stole some money from her roommate, and then left and just never went back to his original nursing home. So I get this call. Now, remember, he's only my biological dad. And my sister, I mean, I don't know. It's no, it's, (laughs) I don't want to make anyone like think they're villains, but this was kind of villainous. We've worked this out, but you know, Um, my sisters were basically like, "Uh, you know, not our dad, not going to deal with it. And I was like, yeah, I hear you. But I, at the time, I hadn't turned 18 yet. I was 17. And I'm like in DeKalb, Illinois, in a dorm room with like my roommate, Kara, who was incredible. But she had like two parents, loving home, lots of money. She could not relate to this situation at all. She was like, your dad walked out of a nursing home and went where? And I'm like, yeah. That's the question. We don't know. And my sisters were not being helpful. And I talked to a detective at the police department. And he's like, you know, we're going to look for him. Blah, blah, blah. I turn 18 on February 13th. And then I get a call February 14th that my dad was found. He had walked at five miles over the course of a couple of days he died of all things from hypothermia all his problems hypothermia is what took him out and I guess when you are dying of hypothermia you feel like you're burning up so he took off all of his clothes folded them which was very my father folded them and laid down on top of them and died in someone's backyard and like at the time it just is so who like thinks that that's ever gonna happen right like plus I literally was like 18 years and one day I also like I didn't have money to get from DeKalb to Chicago because I hadn't anticipated needing to go so like one of my friends moms came and got me and drove me home and I'm trying to like plan a funeral at 18 but I don't know anything I don't know 
where you get money for a funeral. Like, I truly didn't know anything. And everyone else was like, well, it's on you. You know, figure it out. Figure out if you're gonna uh, cremate him or if he's getting buried. But There's no money for a burial plot. You know, it was just like all this stuff that I never had to think about um, and didn't have anyone to turn to. And where where was like, your mom? Your mom with your mom was mom in a nursing was home. In in her nursing home at that time, and like she had multiple sclerosis, but she had started to get some dementia, uh, and so like she wasn't any help. I don't even know if she understood that he was dead. Honestly, like when we told her, um, but I will say that somehow it all came together. <laughs> I can't, I can't tell you how, but it was like, it was every wino in Evanston showed up for my dad's funeral. It smelled like a distillery in there. I was like, do y'all have to be drunk here? No one was with, you know, <laughs> you know you're like, oh, what should I, should I wear black to this funeral? Should I dress up? Should I just do a sweater? These dudes did not think about that at all. They were all in like tattered rags, all crying, all like spilling pints of vodka everywhere. But the best part of my dad's funeral was Dr. Weiss came and he sang the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew. And like everyone was like quiet and like reverent. And it was like so so beautiful but i don't even honestly i don't even know like how we we did it like the funeral home director and i i don't know how we pulled it together um so that was like my crash course in parental death and then i went back to school because i also um i'm like i don't as much as I like indulge myself in my writing, because I do feel like I indulge a lot of stuff that a, a, an ordinary writer would not do, um, I I don't in life like sort of indulge in grief or like or say things like you know I gotta have three days off for my mental health even if I need them. I've never been that type. So I, I, the next day I went back to school and went to class. Um, and so I came home at the end of the semester. I went to visit my mom and I walked into her. She was in hospice at this point. So like after my dad died, they moved her into hospice. And I walked into her room at the hospice place and she immediately started like uh like gasping for air kind of like just like breathing really loud and the hospice nurse was like yeah i think she was just hanging on until she could see you one more time and within like 20 minutes they had her on an in an ambulance on her way to the hospital and then my sisters and i went to the hospital and we uh, got to watch her die, which is weird. It's like, it, it's not upsetting as it wasn't for me ups, as upsetting as it was just like strange, you know, like it's like, you know, we're like looking at the morphine dripping into her and I'm like, I can't believe that we're here. You know, it was like, it was surreal, but and also like funny, but like not really funny, but like funny, right? Like, well, it, like, listen, was, I, so I want to interrupt you. I want to interrupt you because I feel like this is where you are so gifted. You are writing about this in your new collection and it's heartbreaking and sad but also you are able to locate these absurdities. <laughs> like, for, for example, the fact that the doctors give each of your sisters and you like 30 seconds to say I, goodbye. I know, I know, I know. It's so, Brad, you know what? It's like, I 
if I could, if, if my life was good, I could be a person who like romanticize things, right? Who's like, we are gonna, we're going to gather around. We're going to read poems to mom. We are going to apologize for the thing she didn't know we broke, that we lied about. You know what I mean? Like if I had a nice life, that's the kind of thing I would imagine. But I have had so many of these situations where it's just like, like one part of it is just like fucked up. And then it's like, okay, no, this is funny now. Like they would not let us all go into the room together. They would not give us a hallmark goodbye to this woman who gave us life. They were like TikTok, you little bitches, one in, one out, say what you gotta say before she loses consciousness. And it's like, so like that's that's nuts and funny. And then on top of it, you add like us, we all, you know, have seething resentments for each other. And like the negotiation of like who was gonna go with like I'd argue that we should have done it in birth order because then I would be last and my face would be the last one that she saw. Didn't work out like that. Um, And it's just like, I, I think because truly like every event just has that one kernel of like, did that happen? Or did you, did you hear him say that? That that it's it makes it it's almost like it's set up for me to just pluck the weird thing out and build a funny story about around that like terrible thing well and the line you know where you're kind of sitting there at your mother's deathbed and you say something to the effect of i love you so much i'll miss you forever and she sort of what takes the mask off her oh coming. my god it was so fucking dramatic like she reaches up with her skeleton claw <laughs> which i mean she was still having someone like come in and paint her nails i was like girl you are too much so she reaches up with this skinny claw with like these red daggers at the end of it and like drags the oxygen thing away from her face and is like are you sure because my oldest sister and I had been fighting over her almost corpse. <laughs> and I was like, did you just ask, am I sure if I love you? Well, honestly, bitch, maybe not. Like, enjoy <laughs> hell. You know what I mean? Like, what kind of shit is that to do? I just <laughs> went into the hall and I said to my sister Jane, I was like, mom just fucked me up for the rest of my life. That's the last thing I'm going to ever hear that fucking bitch say. <laughs> I was like really being like loving and grown up. I was not making any jokes. I wasn't saying anything like dumb. I wasn't trying to get her to, you know, cause like typical me, I'd be trying to like give her a laugh on her way out. <laughs> but I was like, I'm going to take this seriously. And I'm going to tell my mother how much I love her. And, like, then she had to watch me and Carmen, you know, arguing about nothing. And then <laughs> so quickly, she was like, are you sure? <laughs> God, what? Like, rest in piss, you bozo. Like, well, who does that? Who does that? But so, like, and in the moment, and again, like, I don't know if I have just built up a callus or what but in the moment like after I told Jane about it we both like just started laughing and she's like you know you know you'd prefer it this way and I was like yeah because it's a hilarious wait till I tell everyone at the funeral what she did to me but um I don't I mean like so it's in like instances like that that I'm like oh thank god I can you know, metabolize this and make it funny rather than like letting it ruin the rest of my life. Cause it could, if I was a different person, like that is some terrible shit to say to your child that honestly, you didn't even really get to know that long. 
she went into a nursing home when I was 13 or 14 and she died when I was 18. So that's like five years, five really important years of my growing up that she wasn't there. She's not going to be there for the rest of my life. (laughs) What a fucking bitch to then be like, are you sure you love me? Are you sure you love me? You're the one who's (laughs) dying. You should have taken better care of yourself. What is, yeah, what did she, she went to do a nursing home with MS? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. She, her, I mean, back then, when she got pregnant with me, I was, so she got pregnant in 1979. The doctor, like, the OB was like, Grace, get an abortion. <laughs> my mom was like, oh no, you know. And I think, and I get it. She had my sisters when she was 16, 18, and 21, right? You're not like a mom who's packing lunches, right? She's like trying to graduate high school. She's not, and and you can tell by my early childhood, or it's really apparent to me what she was trying to do. I have every lesson on earth, I have taken it, right? Like I used to ice skate. I play the piano. I play the clarinet. I play the flute. I play the saxophone. Um, wow. I I learned to read at two because she was reading to me constantly. She took me to test into school early. So I started kindergarten at four, which is why I was in college at 17. And it's like, it's so clear to me that she was like, okay, I couldn't do anything with my older kids because like, I didn't have anything. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't take time off work. Um, I'm really going to do a lot with the last one. And so like, I get it. But also the OB was like, you should not have this baby. That's crazy. Don't have a baby. Your Her MS was in remission at the time she got pregnant and didn't come out until didn't come out of remission until I was 10. She had a bad car accident and hit her head on the rear view mirror, had a blood clot in her brain that had to be taken out. And then the MS was like, hello. Um, And then she and I lived together for three excruciating years on our own as, as her MS was out of remission. Um, But it is like, I understand why, And honestly, if you met my sisters, you'd be like, they needed another one, right? Like they need, they needed someone good. Um, (laughs) But that decision now is like, okay, you made it. And now your doctor, like what your doctor said is true. Like you're not going to be around to like know your kid. And that to me, that's my, my one well, regret is the wrong word. For writer, I have a terrible vocabulary. But um, the the one thing that is like kind of an aw shucks about her dying specifically is we never got to the point where like you could talk to your mom like a person. Where Like, I don't know anything about my mother. Like... I could not look at a menu and tell you what she'd order from it, right? I couldn't, t- I could tell you what shows she watched in the 80s and maybe that would inform like what she would watch now. But I mean, my mom would fully be on the Tyler Perry BET nightly <laughs> watching. <laughs> you know, all those black shows where people are like, did you watch The Oval? And you're like, I've never heard of that don't talk to me about that old black people shit but um <laughs> so i but i never got to like i don't know if she ordered a drink what kind of drink she would want or her like basic opinion i mean i know her politics uh, you know to, to meaning that she voted democrat in chicago like everyone else um but i don't, i never got to the point where we could like talk to each other um as equals i mean there's always going to be a little bit of a power imbalance but 
as equals. And that to me, especially now when I see like my friends and like my wife, both of her parents are alive. It's like, ooh, I don't have, you know, it's just like, I imagine it's just like, there's something about talking to the person who like gave birth to you and saw you as a baby and is proud of what you've done. And like my sister's you know, your siblings are always going to have that like sibling edge where they'll be like, I'm proud of you, but those pants look dumb. You know what I mean? It's like, (laughs) right. I'm proud. Take you down a peg. (laughs) I'm proud of you, but I wish you would stop using natural deodorant. You know what I mean? It's always something. (laughs) It's always a caveat. So I do with my dad. I don't know that. I, I feel like if my dad were still alive, I I would just be cleaning up his messes all the time. Like his, he got drunk and did this or he gambled and can't pay this person back. So he, he can stay dead. But if my mom, (laughs) if I could bring back one of them, I would bring her back truly just to be like, so what are you into? Like, what do you, what do you like to do? I, I have no, because like she was doing like mom stuff and we didn't have, I don't know if this is like a cultural thing or just like an age thing, but we didn't have a like, tell your kids what you're doing, where you're going, what you're thinking about kind of relationship. Like she told me what to do or where to go um, and like talk to me about my stuff. But she never was like, God, you know, I really had a hard day at work today. And so it's like, there are just like basic things that I don't know about her that I would, I would love to. That's like, are there any regret? Regret's the wrong word, but you know what I'm saying? Sure. Sure. And are there any other funny people in your family? Like are either, were either of your parents really funny siblings? Like, or is it just, are you the, the one? I, I have one sister who is amusing because she's so mean. (laughs) Like she doesn't make jokes. She's just the kind of person that makes you laugh because she is just like a lit match. You know what I mean? You see like when you see a toddler who's like having a tantrum and you're like, (laughs) that little idiot is so funny. That's, that's what she's like. (laughs) No, I, my dad was very charming and I can be, very charming I mean truly I don't say this as a brag like I just don't think there's anyone who meets me and is like personality is terrible I think like that I got from him like being smooth charming you know like ingratiating yourself to people oh my god I'm so good at like pretending I'm in love with someone I just met and like have them feel that what what are you trying to tell me here <laughs> well, you're gonna be in love with me by the end of this I know so you're gonna no. be trying to fly me out to Palm Springs when we're done. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I I don't think and there's no one who like we all are kind of like silly and good. we're not serious people but I don't think like if you like went to dinner with one of my sisters, you'd be laughing. You'd be like, how are you and Sam related? <laughs> <laughs> uh, y'all don't have the same dad. Got it. You know? Um, but I did, I think growing up, uh, we were a very lax TV house and I watched a lot of old stand up. I mean, like, Eddie Murphy Raw every day on VHS, Robin Harris, every episode of Sanford and Son and What's Happening. Like I watched so much raunchy stand-up and like the kind of stand-up that truly is storytelling and like you're on the edge of your seat. I, I definitely think I got a lot of my kind of like stage presence from watching stand-ups, but I will never do stand-up because it's truly like the only genre of performance where like the audience is encouraged to like hurt the feelings of the person on stage. (laughs) And it's like, listen guys, uh, I'm about to read 2000 words of me hurting my own feelings. I don't need any, (laughs) I don't need any help. 
but I do think I, I picked up a lot of like my storytelling, you know, like, like the cheekiness, you know, how there, there are standups who do the kind of like shy thing before that Bernie Mac would like give the audience a look before he laid down the punchline like that. I definitely took a lot of cues from standup comics. I was really into stand-up comedy myself when I was yeah. a kid. Like I, yeah. I revere, com I revere comedians, and I remember watching Eddie Murphy Delirious and Eddie Murphy Raw. Like they were the greatest thing. Some of this is generational. Like, yeah, I was born in '75, so I'm a bit yeah. older than you. But man, Eddie Murphy was the shit when I was young. Incredible. He was it. Incredible, incredible, just in the way he his command over an audience his and i think one of the things about him specifically that i love so much is how you know he truly is telling like stories like from his life and like his childhood and it's like we all probably have similar moments but like not all of us can like write or talk about them in that way and that was like a big thing for me it's like one of his bits the bit about how he asks his mom for mcdonald's and she's like mcdonald's we got ground beef at home and he goes through explaining like the difference between a house burger on wonder bread with onions and green peppers sticking out of it versus a beautiful little compact sandwich from McDonald's. It's like, you, yes, we all relate. We all have like moments with our parents where they're like, milkshake, I got ice cream at home. I'll make you a milkshake. And it's like, well, I don't want your ice cream and milk in the broken blender. I don't want that. I want the kind from McDonald's that's already a shake um like we all can relate but we all can't tell the hamburger story in a way that is both compelling uh relatable and funny and like but that's that a, and that's what you do that's what you do yeah i was gonna say that's like that's the that's the the job that you're doing you know just in literature as opposed to on stage as a comedian yeah and you know the book that um uh, you know, we're talking about is called quietly hostile. And there's a line where you say quietly hostile is how I would describe my public personality. So there's the issue of being funny. There's the issue of grief and sadness and all of the challenges that we've been talking about that you grew up with. But then there's also the issue of anger, because how could you not be? I mean, we all deal with it as human beings, but especially somebody who had to deal with so much hardship at such a young age and had so many cards stacked against her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there has to be some element of anger in you and, and in all funny people, right? It's like, it's part of the equation. Yeah. I, I feel like the, the funny is what keeps me from, you know, beating people in the grocery store or whatever, you, or whatever I'd be doing. You know what I mean? It's like, I could make a joke or I could strangle this woman in the wine aisle. And so I just make the joke. Um, it's, uh, yeah, trying to, it definitely is a challenge. <laughs> if something that is like, cause I'm the kind of person who like truly I will let my organs boil in my rage filled blood before I'll like have a confrontation with someone like I'm like you know what I really should cuss him out but I don't want anybody to see me cussing him out and what if I'm wrong <laughs> you know like I'm like I just okay uh, it, oh, it's gonna boil my gallbladder till I can't use it anymore great let's do that um so I am I am always pissed off I think though I don't know if this is going to make sense, but like my number one, like person or entity to be angry with is like the universe, right? It's like, I didn't, I did not get a fair fucking shake 
who do I talk to? Who do I? And, and because there's no one, it's like, well, I better figure out how to get over it and like extract what I can from it, which is hopefully a joke. Um, hopefully 2,000 words worth of a joke <laughs> so that I can put it somewhere. But I do, I get, it's so, especially now, like I've had some success, right? And it's like a not huge amount of money changed my life in such a big way. And it's like, it could I had to work so long and so hard, which is fine. But it also is like, I have a little like guilt, guilty anger, you know, for people who, who are still struggling. Um, But uh, like all the things that that truly make me mad are things that like, there's no complaint box, you know? So it's like, I could be walking around mad as hell or I just like try to find the piece of ridiculousness and like laugh about that but it is it's hard I mean it's really hard especially because like thinking about just things like you know if my if my mom had access to better drugs like maybe she'd be alive you know or like if if my dad could have just like if one of those programs would have worked it's like i could think about stuff like that all day and it would drive me crazy but i could or i can just try to like chalk it up to the absurdity of being alive it it's not always easy like sometimes i do just get so mad I do you know what I also get like really mad at my parents um specifically like for the uh specific injustices they've caused in my life I mean thinking about the doctor telling my mom not to have me is a thing like that I think about often because I'm like yo is that why I have this like body that does not work no matter what I do to like if you had not been selfish and wanted a baby so bad I wouldn't be on earth struggling I'd still be I don't know where do eggs go I'd be flushed on a tampon (laughs) just blissfully blissfully flushed yes yeah I would be floating in a canal somewhere minding my little bloody business but instead i'm like fucking trying to figure out how to pay taxes you know listen and but listen you've had a in a lot of ways a rich life too i mean you know life's rich pageant it's good but but that's just when i get down in the like when i really wall when i don't turn to the humor like when i really wallow in it i go all the way back to like pre to embryo sam and (laughs) Well, you might as well start at the beginning, right? If you're going to be comprehensive about this. This is wrong. And if they would have done that, this would have been better. You know, just, just, I try to, I try to avoid the anger because it will pull you in and it makes you irrational. And it has me like worked up about, you know, it'll get me worked up about either systems that I can't change or people who are dead. And it's like, yeah what what does that get me then i'm just like pissed off at no one well you dedicate the book to zoloft so yes i think that is an acknowledgement that there is like like in any human life there's real pain at the heart of the comedy right yes oh the zoloft i have uh my bottle right here (laughs) never leave home without it I, i can't i have to take like 300 milligrams of it to get my my eggs unscrambled um i got diagnosed like nine ish months ago with ocd which i mean the next book is just gonna be about like 
OCD exposure therapy and how terrible that is. But, um, so I'm on the Zoloft to like counter, counteract some of the OCD stuff. And it has, I don't know if it's working, but it hasn't like made me puke. And that to me is a win. I'm like, (laughs) eventually my brain will be right. But as long as my stomach doesn't reject it, we're we're good. I'm putting a lot of faith in Zoloft. That's why I dedicated the book to it because I feel like when I get up to my therapeutic dose, it will solve all my problems. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. So yes. you t- you talk about your body in this book, and yeah. you mentioned just a minute ago about how you have you know you have, there's like health problems. There's Crohn's disease, I believe, yeah. IBS. OCD the worst the Crohn's is like you know what's funny is these commercials that are like on primetime television now where you like see a guy who's like ooh and then he like goes and takes his like I don't know not Sky Rizzy but one of those (laughs) by the way can we just can we just have a moment to acknowledge that Sky Rizzy is the dumbest fucking name for a drug it's so annoying terrible yeah also when will they start putting like what it's for in the name right like just it's too confusing just call it like skin Rizzy like if you're gonna call it Sky Rizzy it's for your skin skin Rizzy (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but you see these like commercials where the and so on the one hand i'm like oh my god thank god it's being normalized because all i ever want to do is like i would like my lasting impact on the world to be that i just made everybody talk about their shitting all the time like that's that's what i'm trying to do <laughs> But like seeing these commercials where it's like a guy's like, ooh, and then he like goes and sits in an airport bathroom. <laughs> that is not real. <laughs> that is not realistic. Like we're we're getting closer. I uh, in December I had, get ready for this, three rectal ulcers. Oh my god. I did not know you could get a rectal ulcer let alone three it is like i mean you're really gonna have to like put your imagination hat on it is like getting struck by lightning in the asshole (laughs) every time you move or sit or breathe (laughs) it was like the crazy i thought i was gonna lose my mind it was the craziest pain it's it like stings it you will jump out of a chair and i'm like where, put this on tv tell people cuz i think sometimes when you have a thing that people can't see or you have a thing that you've had for a long time and so like my friends it's all normalized for us right like if i say i'm going to go to the bathroom they know like Take your shoes off. It's, it might be a minute. Like, relax. <laughs> Go get a snack. I'm going to be indisposed for 20 minutes. Um, and so, like, that's good. But I don't think we, and this goes for a lot of, like, silent or invisible diseases. Is that what they call them? Um, where it just, where you you don't know about how bad it can be. And so, like, sometimes people will ask, I don't know, just, like, ask me to do things that I'm, like, if you thought for five seconds about how my body responds to literally anything, you wouldn't have asked me to do this eight-hour whatever. You know, I can't do the sit-a-thon because (laughs) I have a hemorrhoid hanging out of my asshole. You know what I mean? (laughs) So, like, I am glad that we that it's on tv and people know that it exists and now it's my mission to be like okay i know you've seen the commercials but has anyone ever talked to you about what a hemorrhoid feels like when you have one on the inside and the outside like that's next that is my new mission to talk about like the horrors surrounding the condition just so people know you know, that I'm essentially a soldier. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> fighting the good fight. And I feel like what you, what we're talking about, or what you're talking about here has to do with candor. And this is something that like, distinguishes your work. It is so unbelievably candid. And as I mentioned, like, I think at the top, it's also, you're, you're an incredible voice writer. The effect that I received reading your book was the feeling of you talking to me. And mm -hmm. it's very intimate and it's you right there. But I know from experience that that's not easy to do. To deliver that effect, to have that kind of talky intimacy on the page and this feeling of like really strong, like, like verbal energy. Uh, it's not as simple. I mean, if it were, if it were simple, you would just kind of record yourself talking and then transcribe it. Right. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, a lot of craft that goes into achieving that effect. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering how easily it comes to you because I do feel you have so much innate. I mean, you can just hear it in the conversation we're having now. You have so much innate verbal capacity and you're so funny and it just kind of flows, but how much, struggle is there in getting it down on the page in to its final form wow that's a good question um you're good at this i listened to a bunch of episodes before we started but i'm like oh, brad's really doing it okay <laughs> um <laughs> i okay so this is kind of like a multiple answer like depending on the kind of thing i'm writing the hardest things always the things that are a balance of sad and happy because I don't do sadness generally and and it does not come easily to me I worry about le like it being like schlocky you know or like leaning like too saccharine too sappy too like am I writing this like a lifetime movie kind of thing? So I tend to, if I'm writing like uh, the essay where I talk about my mom and like meeting my, my brother or reconnecting with my brother, it's like, I, I err on the side of less sentimental because I'm, I'm so, I don't know that I do sentiment very well without it feeling cheesy or without it feeling like I'm imitating someone else. That's the big thing is like, how, how do I get something serious on the page without sounding like I'm like cosplaying as, I don't even know who writes sensitive stuff, whoever Oprah likes, right? Like, I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm, I, I'm in my Deepak Chopra era. You know what I mean? It's like, I can't do that. I have to like, have it be me. So those kind of take a while, like for me to get comfortable and then to not throw in a horrible joke when I'm trying to be serious. So that takes a little effort. There is an essay that is not in the galley. So we have to send you a, a real copy of the book that I wrote about how much I love QVC. Oh yeah. I didn't read it's, that one. So You didn't read it or you did? I, I, I have the galley, I believe. Oh, uh, okay. We'll send you a real copy. It, uh, or you can be like, fuck you, bitch. I've read enough. Um, <laughs> like, like, which is, I get. Um, that just, I sat down, wrote it, and it was done. I love QVC. I had a lot to say about it. It just flowed out. And so, like, that tends to be how it goes. Like, funny stuff just goes and i have two secrets that i'm going to tell to your audience I for how to, how i do what i do i don't know if this will help anyone else first i always have the ending always i always know maybe sometimes even the final sentence is written in my notes but i know where i'm going and for me it's always easier to write to a destination right or even if I know the end, I can like, I can work on the outline backwards and be like, okay, well, I want to talk about this thing before that, but then this has to come way before that. And then just kind of like piece it together that way. But I, do, I truly, if I don't have an ending, I can't write it. Like I had started an essay for this collection about 
starting therapy um, because I had started cognitive behavioral therapy like a, a while before I started writing the book and I couldn't because I'm not done with therapy I'm not cured I didn't have any like anything final to say about it I didn't have an ending and I do I have like 500 words of a beginning but I couldn't land the plane I didn't know how I was going to do it so I pushed that to the side so that's one thing that helps me and then the other thing, I, this isn't really a secret, but in terms of like getting, I mean, my tone is always like the same in my head, right? Like it's always like me writing. I have ways that I say things, you know, bits, the whole thing. Um, but one thing that helps me for it to like feel conversational, because that's how I want it to feel. I do want you to be like, my old friend, Sam, look at this scamp. She's so funny, you know, um, is to, I think of someone, like I'll think of one of my best friends and write it as if I'm telling it to them. Like, how would I tell this to Ian? How would I tell this to Jesse? And in my head, I just sort of like picture them and then kind of like write to them. Uh. And that really helps it like feel conversational. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah. something I would add, and you can disagree with me if I'm wrong, okay. uh, is that when I'm reading your work, one of the things that occurred to me, because I was like, how is she so consistently funny? How did she arrive at this voice that is both like, has this like, feels casual and intimate, but also literary. And then uh, like when you add it all up and it goes over well, one of the things that occurs to me is like, you know, this is not shtick. Like she means this stuff. I think that maybe somebody sitting down with the aspiration to write funny might make the error of being like, I'm just going to look for the joke and put on like a funny air. The reason I think your work goes over well is that however funny it is, whatever like postures, you know, you might be falling into or bits that you might be doing at the heart of the work, you mean it. Yeah. It's authentic. It's yeah. not just you looking for a joke. It's you looking for a joke in the course of it authentically exploring how you think and feel. Yes. It's an important distinction, right? Yes. Yeah. It's definite. And I think that's another, I, honestly, this is on my mind because you would not believe how many people ask why I don't do stand up. But what we're talking about is like the reason I don't do stand up is I do want it if I feel it and believe it then I'm gonna say it and I don't ever want anyone to be like oh is she creating a character because that's I don't want that um and I've never had any desire to like I, and you know why it comes <laughs> I mean I wish I could be like oh I have a ton of artistic integrity which I obviously do but <laughs> um <laughs> It's a trap. If you're anyone other than yourself, you can't meet people. You can't go on tour. You can't do an interview because then it's just like work to keep this persona going, right? It's like, you got to, I got to remember like, okay, what did I say? What do I believe? Hmm. Okay. To this person, I hate men. Well, let me make sure I talk about how much I hate, you know, it's so, it's hard. That makes life hard for me so if I am myself and I think sometimes like people get uncomfortable with how self-deprecating I am you know and I'm always like the villain of my own story like at the heart it's about how I messed something up or felt something wrong or interpreted something the bad way in or like in the worst way but it's just it truly it keeps me from I just never want anyone and we all know writers who like feel like they are on top of a mountain reading their words from a golden scroll handed down by Jesus himself and it's like I was eating Panera when I wrote this you know what I mean like I'm not gonna put on airs like that's crazy so I think like it would like it humiliated me so much 
uh, to like have a persona, but but mostly I could never keep it up. I could never. I'm so lazy. I'm so forgetful. I get stoned every day. I would be like, do okay. This is so stupid. Did you ever see the movie The Stepfather? It's like a ninety minute horror movie. Doesn't matter. Is it wait, wait? Is this like early nineties? Is it like yeah, it like Dylan the... Baker's the stepdad, and I the think kid I have... from Gossip Girl is in it. I think I yeah, I think I might have seen it. It's just been a minute. <laughs> There's so this guy is like using a fake identity, and he's gonna kill his uh, new family, and he goes from family to family, changing his identity. And at one point, they're in a fight. And he calls himself the wrong name. And the wife is like, what? And he's like, wait, who am I here? That is a feeling I do not ever want to have. Like where I've given the impression to someone. Honestly, that's why I never am like, I'm smart. Because people people expect you to be smart then. And this way, I'm always a pleasant surprise. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh man, she kept telling us how stupid she was, but she actually was okay. That's intentional. <laughs> okay, so here's a, here's a maybe an unanswerable question, but it's mm-hmm. one that I can't help but ask okay. every time I read somebody who works in the vein that you do is able to be funny on the page, is able to go places that most writers wouldn't dare to go, say the unsayable, go into the scatological, <laughs> and, and just, just wherever. You can get away with anything. And I think particularly in this day and age of social media, and it's easy to step in it, right? You could say oh. something that pe- people would recoil from. And so I think in particular, when you're doing blue humor, there is some fear at least from my perspective, involved. Like, should I make this joke? If I make this joke, is somebody going to get their feelings hurt? Am I going to get called out on social media? This, that, and the other. And what it feels like to me, like the metaphor that comes to mind is like walking on a tightrope, you know? And I marvel at your work because I'm like, it's like there you never slip. Like you can go anywhere. The audience is with you. Do you have a sense of how to do that? Do you just not give a fuck? Do you have to just turn off that part of your brain? Or do you think that part of your skill as a writer is having a very well-developed sense of an audience and just being tuned into where to step and where not to step? Okay, so I think about this probably more than I should uh, because I am... So I I am sensitive both to like what other people need or want, uh, but also to people who like misunderstand me or, you know, want to yell at me about something I've done, which is fine, like whatever. I I think in the writing, like one of the things that it... it It's very freeing that my parents are dead, right? There's no one who is going to be like, you have shamed the family. (laughs) Like, I just don't have those pressures, right? Like that deep, like you are destroying a family. So that's like the first thing that's like, I can be free. I can say whatever. I think having come from like blogging, like in the late two thousand, late two thousands. Bit bitches um, got to eat. Yes, yeah. The name yeah. of your blog. Yes, please. It's well, we can talk about this maybe next book, but I'm doing a like retrospective for the next book where I take my old blog posts and like am in conversation with them. <laughs> Uh, because it was like a chronicle of my 30s and now I'm in my 40s and seeing what how new Sam feels about old Sam Um, but I think like coming from a blogging during that time like pre okay see I'm gonna switch this answer a little I feel like we live in a gotcha time right everyone is just 
they don't even like consider the thing they're just parsing through it to find where you fucked up and how quickly they could tell someone else you fucked up they don't tell you but how quickly they could tell someone else that you fucked up and then start talking about whatever it is you've done i cannot care about that because i know i know what i am and i know what i'm not right like i know what my politics are i know how i feel about groups of people like i don't really have a problem with anybody i want everybody to do what they want to do as long as it doesn't fuck with my shit in any way uh i feel like children are starving and need welfare and education but you know so right like so i'm like i don't have any politics that are like incendiary or would get the kind of people who would read my work to not read it anymore so i think like generally as long as i stay where i'm acquainted <laughs> as long as i stay in the subjects that that I know, then I don't worry about what I'm saying. I really, because I know it's, I haven't said anything like broadly offensive or that like betrays something I hold dear. So it's like, for instance, once my friend sent me a picture, she works in a library, some lady took out my book she, it was the original meaty th that had a chicken on the cover. I don't know if she thought it was about farming or chicken meat or what, but she wrote a letter to the library about having this filth on, on their shelves. And there's a chapter in that book called Sorry I Shit on Your Dick. <laughs> 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 so, like, I'm like, I get it, ma'am. I okay, all right, I get it. Uh, but it's like some prude getting mad about like my cuss words or whatever. Like, I don't give a shit about. I don't want to hurt anyone who is worse off than I am. Like, that's basically it. I don't do, punch. I don't punch gonna, down. Yeah, I'm never gonna shit on somebody who uh, I would be looking down at, or I, not even looking down at, but like in a better position then. So I don't worry about that because I know I don't do that shit. A thing I do worry about is that things are changing so quickly that like I don't always know what's offensive because that shit changes. So for this book, we had a sensitivity reader and I only got one thing flagged and I changed it. And so like, and again, I don't want to look like a dinosaur. I don't want to not keep up with things, but also I, I can't let, <laughs> I can't let motherfuckers who do not have receipts for purchasing my books tell me shit. I don't really worry about a goddamn thing. I'm like, if you, you can't be scared of people on the internet, right? Like I just, I am. And I just remind myself that I don't have to be all the time. And it's especially because I think maybe I'd worry about it more. I have a, a thing in this book where I'm like, I will argue with people on the internet when they can upload their IDs. And so I know who I'm talking to because you know who I am, right? Like I wrote up, this shit has my name on it. You know that it's me, but like arguing with someone who's like disingenuous, like a 13 year old who's like, you know, just wants to say something dumb. I can't, I can't think about that stuff. Cause it's like, it's not real, you know? And you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to function as an artist. No. I mean, I just think, I don't know, personally, I have like almost ultimate tolerance for people if I know that they are in good faith trying to be fine. Yes, that is the thing is there's no benefit of the doubt anymore. Like you'll hear a thing and you'll be like, oh, I know her. She didn't mean that like that. But it's like, because like people can anonymously like say, yes, she did. Then, then, you know, the, the firing squad 
comes out. I also am like, I am the kind of person who, uh, one thing that like befuddles me, if I see a movie I don't like, I don't have to get online and tell people I don't like it. I just will never watch that movie again. But the thing that, and like, if you want to bitch about things online, great. You have a community to do that. Perfect. The thing that like kills me is the like, I don't like this. It must change. And I'm like, well, don't look at it. Don't read it. Many, many, not as many people as I would like want to read about piss and shit all the time. (laughs) I would tell those people not to read my books. I'm not going to change what I write. Like for $17 that a random house gets, fuck that. I'm going to write what I want. (laughs) I'll change my shit for somebody who's like, I'll buy a hundred thousand copies. I'll write whatever the fuck you want. But like (laughs) most of the people who get mad don't even buy your shit anyway. And I hate to make it about like dollars, but truly that's, that's where it goes for me is like, I can't be making every Tom, Dick and Harry who just like happened to cross the thing I wrote and decided that I'm a piece of shit. I can't be kowtowing to them, but I especially cannot be kowtowing to them without proof that they have spent money on my work. There you go. You can, you that's go. why I will always talk to someone at a reading who has my book in their hand with the receipt stuck inside because I'm like, <laughs> you can give me an opinion. You paid. People who didn't pay, fuck them. I, oh my <laughs> God. Okay, so before I, before you were able to change Instagram settings so that people couldn't tag you, when Why well, Not Think It came out, somebody posted it on their Instagram and was like, I like this book or whatever, and tag me, fine. I'm, I'm not going to comment. I'm not going to look. I don't care. But then somebody in <laughs> the in their comments tagged me to say there was a stunning lack of race and class analysis in this book. I'm like, Brad, when I tell you that if I had a rocket and could get to her, (laughs) I would have used it. So I commented back. And first of all, imagine picking up a book with a fucking bunny on it and being like, (laughs) can't wait to get into the race and class analysis here. We, I advertise what the shit is. Right. If you look at the cover, nobody's thinking, hmm, deep sociological dive. They're thinking (laughs) fart jokes. And like, it's not my fault if you picked up the fart joke book and it doesn't have like a breakdown of the sociopolitical goings on in America right now. So I commented back and I was like, this book costs $13 on Amazon. It's paperback. I only went to high school. You better go to Ta-Nehisi Coates with that. <laughs> and leave me alone. Right. And then she was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm like, I wouldn't have seen that if she hadn't tagged me. But like, I'm almost grateful that she did because people are not making good faith. There are very few good faith criticisms that take what you actually do or did into account, right? And it's like, I can't be beholden to somebody's personal things. If I say something about a community, which is not a thing I do, I'll eat shit, right? Like, I will eat shit for that. But like, you know, just because you wanted a history book and I like describe my labial folds in excruciating <laughs> detail. And that doesn't make my book bad. It's just not what you wanted to read. I mean, maybe yeah. it does make my book bad because who wants to read labia? But for in this case, it makes my book good. And <laughs> you can go read other stuff. You That's just right. Read something else. That this whole thing, like. I don't like it, therefore it should not exist, is 
bananas to me. It's bananas. I agree. People need to lighten the fuck up. I, yes. You know, a lot of the time. Which is I mean, not some... that serious. Like, go yeah. adopt a dog. Or like, are you bored? Go do something. Oh, <laughs> God. Well, listen, I could talk to you all day. I, I have to say that the career you've built for yourself, writing these really successful books, these really funny books, these books that are all like kind of branded the same way. Like you've got like a, you've got a series going, which I love. And on top of that, you're writing for television. I believe you've written for Lindy West's show Shrill, Showtime's yeah. work in progress. Are you now writing for HBO's? Am I, do I have, am I up to date? And just like yeah, that. And just like that, I worked on season two, the trailer came out a couple days ago that's a whole i mean we should do a podcast on writing for tv i'll talk about that more next time how uh insane tv feedback is because the thing about books is nobody fucking reads right it's like you me and six other people reading books <laughs> uh but everybody watches tv and like the deluge of tv opinions versus like the six book opinions. <laughs> right, right. Like, whew, it's, I was not ready to work on a big show or I was not ready to watch the culture hate this big show that I worked on. That really fucked me up. Oh, uh, oh my God. Damn. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a crazy business too. The oh, business side of it, the worst. taking the meetings and the f feedback and the... It's Dude. so dumb. That's the thing about LA that that I both love and hate is people are always like, oh, everyone in LA is rude. Never. Everybody I've ever met in Los Angeles, nicest fucking person you want to meet. You want to you want them to be your child's godmother, all of it. But they don't say the truth to you, which is the the drawback. Like I have never walked out of a meeting being like, oh. -oh that dude really hated my fucking guts. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. He would like to de-lesbianize me. And it's like, <laughs> no, he right. actually hated my fucking guts. He's just very good at convincing me otherwise. I I'm, I mean, I've been in a million general meetings. Yeah. And every, time I, every time I walk out, I'm like, I think like we're going to be, if, if we don't do business together, like I think we're going to be friends. Yes! <laughs> and then you never hear a fucking word from them ever, ever. again for the rest of your life. Ever. I don't I, roll I like that. I'm at the point where, and this like feels bratty, but but it's because of the books that I can kind of be like a bitch about Hollywood. I'm like, I can't take a meeting unless they're offering me a job. Like, the t I will tap dance and do whatever I got to do if they're like, here's a paycheck at the end. But like, right. just to meet because they're quote unquote big fans. No, Fuck I don't that. do those anymore no yeah good for you good for you that's the way to be because like i this is a bunch of bullshit otherwise and yes. what a, what, there's just people and like people who work in quote unquote development who just have empty calendars and need to fill them up i know that's it why does development take so fuck they have all the time for meetings but then when you turn in a thing to them oh hear from you in six months okay great yeah <laughs> The gears of the machine slow down all of a sudden to a fucking yeah. crawl. They're like, oh, we got you now. Uh, what was the option? We gave you $2,000 that your agent took 1800 of. Okay, yeah. cool. Now that we've got you locked in, why do you take eight months to work on the thing we actually might pay you to make? It's uh -huh. gross. It's definitely for, I didn't start feeling old till I started like counting my time in Hollywood years. Of, they're in the book I do the the kind of like the list of things that have happened since I started being in development on my show and like counting up the birthdays <laughs> it's like but the full humans adults have grown from my wife's children since we started this uh this this thing that's never gonna be anything like I gotta get out of it so I'm now I'm like, I'll work on and just like that because it's the best and I love everyone there and it's a moneymaker for HBO. So I don't think they're going to like cut us off. But the idea that I might get anything of my own made, I just had 
I was in development with Sony and I just had a, they they ultimately rejected my script for honestly, I'm gonna email it to you. This killer show idea that I think they're missing out. But it's like the books books have never treated me the way Hollywood has. So don't worry, I will be staying here. <laughs> Well, future. listen, the odds of somebody with your childhood building the kind of career that you've built are not, they're pretty long odds. Like yeah. you've managed to do something that's really incredible. I hope you appreciate it. Oh, um, my not God. like, not, not like great. I'm grateful for it, but I hope you can, can kind of pat yourself on the back a little bit. Like this I'm is amazing. I'm bad at that. I'm bad at I, the back padding. But I will say, like, that somebody hit me up the other day and was like, hey, I want to get into TV writing. Can we talk? And I was like, yeah, we can talk anytime. But my path has been so, we like, untraditional is the nice way to say it. Like, uh, there's no nepotism. There's no, I went to school with, you know, I went to Harvard when we were on the Lampoon and my friend got me a job, like, there was none of that. And I do, there were so many like right place, right time things. I got my agent. So Meaty first came out um, on an indie Chicago press. I Minimal distribution, like it just tiny. And somehow my now agent got a copy, found me and was like, do you have representation? And I was like, no for what and he's like a literary agent and i was like who who oh. is it no it's kent wolf oh my god i love him he truly he's very mean and i'm scared of him but i also love him um <laughs> <laughs> but it, like he called he called me on the phone we watched like in our separate apartments watched the oscars red carpet and then at the end, I was like, okay, so you're my agent now, right? And he was like, yeah. And then he's like, do you, so what ideas do you have for your next book? And I was like, oh, I don't have any ideas. I thought you would just like be my agent. And when I came up with something, you would sell it. And he's like, come up with something i'd love to sell it like i had no idea what i was doing and so like coming from that which was essentially like truly printed out blogs stapled together and hot glued with a cover to like getting this agent who the first time i walked into the random house offices i was like i almost shit you know what i mean it's just like <laughs> Are you kidding me? What, my first audiobook, when I recorded it for We're Never Meeting in Real Life, I get a thing from an email from the producer. And he's like, you know, we're going to set up this time, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, uh, I'm not available to direct you. I would love to, but I'm going to be directing Barack Obama's audiobook. And I was like, what? Like, I, I, you know what I mean? Like I was scooping cat shit two years before this, right? And getting like working at an at, working at an animal hospital. Yes, yes. Oh, sorry, everyone who has not read my entire of um yeah, working at an animal hospital, getting bit by fucking min pins, and now I'm emailing a dude who's like telling Barack Obama to like slow down when he reads. It's, I will never not be like dazzled by this whole thing because it like, it really is like amazing. And I get to stay down to earth because I fucking live in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, nobody is checking for me here. Nobody's like, oh, Sam, can't wait to read your new book. They're like, uh, next, <laughs> ma'am, it's your turn. Um, yeah. And like, it's, it it is like really amazing. Like when I stop and think about it, I am really amazed and really proud of myself, and also a little bit in disbelief, and also waiting for the other shoe to drop. So 
I got to get as many books out as they will buy from me <laughs> before they're like, okay, fat black bitches are out. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> well, I always ask my guests if what, I mean, I know you have a lot going on. You're writing for TV. It sounds like you have that other book about what, where you're reacting to your old blogs. Is that the next Oh yeah. That, I talked to my editor yesterday. She's like, yeah, can you get back to me in 11 months? And I was like, I'll start it in nine months and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> Ooh, I hope she doesn't listen to this, but I mean, let me fix that. I'm diligently working on <laughs> Well, it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I could keep going. I mean, I could we could talk Me all day, too. and I I hope to have another chance to uh, At to have you on any time. Well, Sam, congratulations again on quietly hostile. It is hilarious as all of your work is. Thank you. Congratu congratulations on working. What, what's it called again? And just like that, that's the, forgive yeah. me, I'm terrible at television, but no, that's the Sarah the Jessica Sex Parker. The city reboot. I mean, everyone just calls it sex in the city. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's a big show and yeah. uh, look forward to whatever you come up with next in, uh, you know, in your book work and wish you well. Thank you. I can't wait to come on every single time I have anything coming out. Get ready. <laughs> I'm going to feel like a co-host. Um, thank you for, this was truly like the greatest conversation. And I'm so grateful that you had me on and that you asked such thoughtful questions and made me think. And we could talk about Eddie Murphy. I mean, this was really, I mean, I hope we could be friends. I'm saying this so other people can hear it and force you to be my friend. So hoping we can be friends. We can be friends. <laughs> I'll be your friend. Great. We're, offic we're officially friends as, as of right now. Best, best interview I've ever had. 